have been investing in uh, real estate for more than 30 years uh, a little bit differently to a lot of people. I never did the negative gearing thing. Um, didn't make sense to me. I could I, well, I didn't have enough income to be able to afford properties that lost money. So I had to buy ones that made money. Um, and yeah, that sort of evolved into, well, how can I get more and more cash flow out of it? And that's where rooming houses came in. Welcome to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel leading weekly show for Australians who want to learn how to unlock their full self, health and wealth potential. I'm your host, Bushy Martin, and each week I go deep with the best investors, experts, leaders and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind, discover freedom and to live by design. Subscribe now and join me. Get invested in the life that you really want. Let's get started. Hi, Freddie Fighters. Are you a property investor that's increasingly struggling to make things work and struggling to make ends meet? A rising rates, taxes, compliance, rental reforms and the cost of just about everything make it increasingly difficult for you to keep affording to hold your investment properties long enough for you to enjoy the fruits of capital growth at the end of your journey. Because, in my humble opinion, long-term cash flow affordability is the number one factor that separates sustainably successful investors from the rest. And it's one of the major reasons why still over forty, over 54% of first-time investors end up selling their investment property within the first five years. And it's because they just aren't able to live long enough on a diet of toast and two-minute noodles when their property is costing them an arm and a leg to hold on to on the quite uncertain promise of a bigger nest egg years into the future. So what can you do about it? How can you improve the long-term cash flow affordability of your investment properties? How can you turn a negatively geared property that's burning a hole in your pocket each and every week into a potentially super cash flow money-making machine? Now, what if you had the opportunity to convert a single tenant home with a net yield after taxes and costs of about 2 to 3% that ends up costing you thousands of dollars a year into multiple income streams that have the potential to produce up to and potentially in excess of 330% more cash. Now imagine how this would change your life, shifting from struggle town to easier street. Would you be interested? Well, if this has picked up your ears and you want to know more, then you've landed in the right place. Because our guest for the next two episodes is going to show you how he has personally done it and how you too can look to do the same. But like most things, it's simple in theory, but it's not so easy in practice because the devil's always in the detail and it's not for the faint-hearted. Now, I'm talking about Mark Baker, who you may have heard recently on our Realty Talk shows. And as you're about to hear, after a fairly challenging time running multiple businesses uh, some years ago, he discovered the benefit of investing in a special type of positive cash flow property that's allowed him and his family to achieve his version of financial freedom and live solely off the income from the, his property portfolio for well over 10 years now. As a result, Mark's one of the most knowledgeable experts in Australia when it comes to rooming and boarding house properties, along with the associated specialist legislation right across the country. And he currently consults with state governments in this very specialist area. He's now a director of the Registered Accommodation Association of Victoria, which is the peak industry body for rooming houses in the state. So as you can see, he's a man who wears many hats. So if you've ever dreamed of leaving the rat race sooner rather than later, then these are episodes of Get Invested that you just can't afford to miss, as Mark shares his inspiring story of how rooming houses have actually transformed his life. So welcome, and let's get invested, Mark. Thanks for having me on, Bushy. But, uh, we had a great chat on Realty Talk a while ago, and that really got yep. me interested in getting you on to do a, a deep dive on the subject uh, which we're going to enjoy over the next couple of episodes. But uh, for those who have missed that and, and haven't heard about you, can you sort of kick things off by uh, giving us a bit of a rundown on what you do differently and, more importantly, why you do what you do, mate? Um, well, how far do you want to go back? I mean, I have been investing in uh, real estate for more than 30 years, uh, a little bit differently to a lot of people. I'd never did the negative gearing thing. Um didn't make sense to me. I could I, well, I didn't have enough income to be able to afford properties that lost money. So I had to buy ones that made money. Um, and yeah, that sort of evolved into, well, how can I get more and more cash flow out of it? And that's where rooming houses came in. Uh, I think we're about 14 years ago now, started yeah. on that. Um, 
And um, yeah, why I do that is basically for the income. Like I didn't want to, uh, I know it sounds a bit funny, so I, I didn't want to, yeah, spend all my life working. However, I continue to do that anyway. We talked about earlier. Um, it's kind of stop now, but uh, I suppose that's, yeah, if you enjoy what you're doing um, and you, you know, keep doing it, it doesn't feel like work. Um, but it's 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 been about, you know, creating the income from it so that, you know, um, you know help my family have choices, you know, me have choices. Um, I don't know, is that, that's, that's, yeah, that's probably the, you know, the crux of it. That's, yeah, yeah okay. That's well, I do. Yeah, let, let, let's wind back then because I'd, I'd like you to sort of take us on your, both your personal, your professional and and your property journeys yep. and we'll, we'll, we'll leave the property ins and outs until a little bit later on. But uh, can you give us a bit of a run through, you know, before you you got involved in property all, all together, what were you doing? Uh, what changed that and what triggered the, the move uh, into property? So can you take us a bit, back through a bit of that history? Look, I've probably a lot of the time had businesses of some sort. Um, you know, even go back to you know, go back to you know, school. I'd be riding my bike to school. I'd stop at a you know, milk bar on the way, buy some bars of chocolate, and so on for a profit at school. It's like <laughs> so. Always had that approach to. Um, yeah, it's it's not so much. Yeah, you know, some of some of it is about you know how you can make money from doing things, but it's also about. Um, one of the things I sort of looked at is, yeah, if I wanted something, how can I get somebody else to pay for it for me? And sometimes for that, so the margin on things wasn't necessarily about getting the money out. It was about getting a product or something that I wanted. So I might have wanted some chocolate at lunchtime. So I might buy five chocolate bars and sell four of them for the price of five. So mine's free. Right. right. But um, where did that where did that come from, mate? Because it, <laughs> for someone at a, at a pretty young age to be doing that, and I did some similar things yeah. too, because I... I, I, you know, came from a, a pretty average background, and uh, you know, I, I, I used to my pocket money was finding uh, uh, empty bottles that I could get the refunds on. And if I got enough of them, that's yeah. that was enough to keep me in lollies, mate. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm probably a bit older than you, but uh, where did that sort of a, approach to life? Uh, is that just yeah. inherent in you, or is that something that came out of your background? Share share a bit of that with us. It, it probably is. I mean, I, I probably used to do the same. It's like with collecting you know, cans and all that sort of stuff, and. Yeah, getting around on my bike, but um, look, my um, my dad always had businesses as well, so it's probably part of it that came from there. Um, it was just the yeah, I suppose the nature of yeah, it's, it, it's how I knew things worked. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it yeah. probably is a little bit inherent, but I mean, you inherit that from your parents too. So yeah, exactly by osmosis almost. So yeah. so you, when you left school, what what sort of uh, businesses did you did you get involved in? Um. Look, I, I mean, there's a few things. When I when I first left, I did have a couple of jobs. Uh, and I, you know, I was doing stuff for, in the in electronics, and as so I ended up doing a little bit in sales and engineering supplies and stuff like that. But um, went into a business. Then I was actually selling clothing. So, um, and uh, started doing stuff effectively door to door. You know, going taking products around, selling stuff door to door. Had other people doing that with the same products that I had. Yeah, went into then wholesale and retail in clothing for a bit. Um, from there, yeah, this is going back to, you know, we're talking back in the 90s. Um, my, and I was yeah, talking about, I was always into technology and stuff as well. I'm talking about mobile phones and yeah. my wife's like, oh, why don't you just go and get a you know, job in a mobile phone shop for a bit and you know, get, get that out of your system. So did that, then ended up, yeah, you know, opening up a mobile phone shop and then a couple of them. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, grew from there. Here. So, yeah, evolved from one thing to another. I had a clothing store that turned into a mobile phone store. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I love that. The uh, I, something I'm interested in there because the the there aren't many people that would have the the resilience to be going knock on someone's door and try and sell something, mate. Uh, because yeah. you know that, that's a a massive exercise in rejection. Uh, most of the yep. times, and and not many people have the gumption uh, to do it or to sustain it uh, for any uh, period of time. Where, where, where did that sort of because uh, and again that those skills are transferable into property because that resilience, yep. patience, persistence, and the and the ability to keep going, uh, irrespective of no, is is a bit of a quality that I see in a lot of successful investors. So is that again? Is that something you it was just part of who you were, or is that something that you're initially scared 
crapless about that you develop the skill to be able to handle that rejection and the knockbacks? Um, I, I think I just had fun with it. It didn't really phase me. I thought people are either going to say yes or no, but whatever, let's get the answer as quick as I can so I can get to more people and you know, find enough yeses is is the tick thing and just had fun with it. Um, yeah, even when I said when I first you know, went into mobile phones, I still went around to all of the businesses around where the shop was to let them know I was there and all that sort of stuff. And I did that until the shop was so busy I couldn't leave it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, um, I haven't really been uncomfortable with that. So yeah. I understand, you know, I understand where yeah you know, that feeling comes from. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, everyone gets it. I, I'm sure I do get it sometimes. It's like, oh, but what if? But what's what's the worst that's going to happen? Is is yeah. the thing. It's like the worst that happens is people say no. Well, they might yell at you, tell you to get out, or whatever. It's like. <laughs> Right. On to the next one. And, and I think that, that statement, what's the worst thing that can happen, yeah. is actually a life philosophy that, that tends to separate people who do achieve success and whatever they decide to pursue versus that are those that are too scared to have a go. Uh, so hmm. I, I, I know I've shared this uh, on the podcast before, but my father-in-law, that, that there was almost his version. He's a, a Hungarian migrant who came here with a suitcase and, and did amazing things in this country before he passed a few years ago. And uh, he, he didn't believe in problems. There was just challenges to overcome. And when everyone would come to him and say, yeah, oh, I've got a problem, George, he'd say, did someone die? <laughs> oh, and they'd say, oh, no, well, it's not a problem then. Uh, yep. What's the worst thing that can happen? It's a, it's a really, really good uh, approach to life in that sense. So, uh, mate... Um, you had a pretty interesting background, uh, and, and I know you've done quite a number of podcasts and uh, presentations and whatnot in the past, but uh, I'd love for you to share something unique or interesting about you that you've never actually uh, shared publicly before. Have you got anything to tease us with? Look, I mean, some of that about the you know, door-to-door sales and stuff is probably you've gone a bit deeper than, <laughs> than I've talked about before. One of the things, look, that I may have mentioned, and most of what I've talked about is, um, you know, businesses that I've had and stuff like that. But yeah, in jobs working for somebody else, like I mentioned with the electronics work and sales and yeah, just to deliver pizzas and things like that. But the um most people wouldn't pick what my last paid job working for somebody else was. No, well and, uh, yeah, you've got 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 bait of breath there, mate. Again, was it? It, was, it was in the nineties. I was I was working as a bouncer at a pub. So I'm not going to pick an argument with you, Mark, is that the phrase we say? You've got some Krav Maga moves or or something that's going to put me on the floor in five seconds if I say the wrong thing. Yeah, look, I've, I mean, I've again, I have done a fair bit of you know, martial arts. I did judo with judo when I was a kid. Um, you know, I've done a fair bit of karate throughout my life. I have competed in mixed martial arts as well. Okay, okay. So, um, this is actually you know within the last um, within you know the time that I was running um, rooming houses, and we'll get into that. So I had actually broken my leg, and we'll talk more about that soon. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we were. Um, 14 months after after I broke my leg was my last mixed martial arts fight in the ring. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. Interesting. So, well, yeah, I, I won't be picking your fight or having an arm wrestle with you, Mark. But uh, I, I hear you're... I, I'm, I'm a... pretty unfit now. <laughs> well, I also hear in the in digging around that uh, back in 2017, you were nominated for the Australian of the Year Award, mate. Uh, tell yep. us about that. Yeah, and that was um, that I think came about from, from the rooming houses. So a fair bit of what we do is... You know, um, in the welfare end of the market, you know, not quite you know, social housing, but in the welfare end of the market, so people that would otherwise be homeless. Not an easy market to deal with by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Um, and yeah, unless you know what you're getting into, I wouldn't. It's a whole world that you wouldn't even know existed unless you unless you're in there. Yeah. Um, so look, I think it came out of that. Yeah, you know, the provision of housing and you know, the amount that we were doing and it brought on not with just our own properties, but yeah, getting other investors involved and stuff like that as well. So yeah. there was a nomination there for Australian Year in 2017. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, mate. And I, uh, uh, you've sort of also sort of shared behind the scenes that you have a yeah, almost a photographic memory. Uh, is is that? Yeah, I do tend to remember things pretty well. Um, yeah, uh, it, which helps a bit with. Um, well, yeah, you, you mentioned at the start about yeah how complicated stuff in rooming houses can be with the you know myriad of legislation and regulations that apply and you know the government keeps changing things and yeah you, know, you mentioned the registered accommodation association of victoria it's like with that so we consult on the legislation and regulations and 
just when we think, geez, they've done everything they can and they bring out something else. Um, but I tend to be able to read and comprehend a lot of the legislation and remember what I've read. So, you know, someone will say, oh, but it says this. Oh, no, it says this. So I'll have conversations with building surveyors sometimes, you know, because of, yeah, out of, if you've got insomnia, read the National Construction Code. I have <laughs> read a lot of that as well. But just, but to start with, I'm, I'm reading that thinking, how the hell does anybody understand this? I need someone yeah. to explain it. Yeah. And, you know, now from having read it, remembering stuff in it, yeah, you know, I can often explain parts of it to people, including building surveyors that work with it. So they'll bring yeah. something up. Oh, yeah, we, you've got to do this. And it's like, no, well, actually, it's like, it's in what it says. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, so what I'm hearing, mate, is uh, uh, I, I wouldn't like to be your wife, Amanda, mate, because you're probably the sort of guy that says that in, in, back in 1999, we talked about this and... <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, so that's oh, no, no, I'm... I, I know, I know the limits. It's like I can just go, okay, yeah, <laughs> happy life, happy life, mate. Uh, yeah, that's uh, you're spot on there. But yep. that uh, uh, turning to a more, more, uh, I guess, serious side of the equation, then, Mark. What what challenging event in your life uh, has brought about your greatest learnings and and best changes? Do you think? Yeah, look, I think. Um, well, I, I mentioned the mobile phone shops before, Paul, and this is probably. Well, probably it is around the 14 years ago now is where a lot of the stuff changed. I said we've been getting into that, um, into rooming houses a lot more since then. Yeah. Um, my, well, you mentioned Amanda, my wife. So she was diagnosed with breast cancer in, so it would have been, I think it was May 2010. Um, and yeah, you know, again, like what you said with your father in law, I think we have the same approach to that. It's like, well, it's not a problem. It's just, yeah, you know, a challenge we're going to find a solution to. Yeah. So, um, yeah, obviously, you know, grateful about the fact that we had, you know, businesses there. We had, you know, had been buying property for a number of years at that stage as well. Yeah. So I mentioned started buying property and we, and started with positive cash flow more than 30 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. um, businesses on the other hand had been up and down and we'd had mobile phone shops for about 15, 16 years at that stage. Yeah. And, um, that, the margins had been, you know, tightened and tightened by the networks, which, yeah, you know, in some ways I could say, look, I probably stayed in too long because, you know, I said that that was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. I'd seen track records from other countries. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, oh, this is great. You know, we'll keep going until, yeah, until it wasn't. Um, and, yeah, so, and so really the property had sort of carried us through because, Whilst we hadn't all focusing on growth, yeah, they had gone up in value anyway, so there was some equity there. We'd used that to support businesses at the time where margins were tighter. Right. Um, and yeah, the realization, yeah, well, I'll, I'll continue on with yeah, Amanda's um, story with breast cancer. So she had breast cancer. Yeah, like I said it was fairly large. They would have normally done um, surgery first, but they didn't. They had to trade it first, and it shrunk down. And yeah. Um, and reduce the tumour considerably. Okay. However, one other, one other thing that had happened there, I mentioned Malik before, this is three days after her first chemo treatment. She's at home in bed, hadn't eaten for three days, thinking someone's going to come home and get some food for me soon. She gets a phone call from me, I've broken my leg. Right? <laughs> so, I'm off to hospital with a broken leg. Um, I didn't realise that at the time. I said, oh, look, yeah, I, I, was, I was actually martial arts training and... Um, oh. And I said, oh, look, you know, I've uh, you know, gone down a bit awkwardly and I can't get up at the moment. You know, the ambulance is here. They want to take me to the hospital. But, yeah, I'll be able to get up soon. I'll be right and I'll be home. So it's like, I was wrong. Uh, really? So I had to have surgery um, on my leg. My wife says that, you know, I didn't like her getting the attention, so I had to get the attention back on me. But, uh, <laughs> That's one way to do it. But, yeah, that gave us some time, like, because we are both basically at home in bed for... Yeah, you know, several weeks. I think the main, yeah, you know, recovery on my leg was about six weeks. It was about ten weeks before I was weight bearing. Um, wow. It was a reasonably serious yeah, break. Did, did a good job. Yeah, um, but it gave us time at home to then go and all right. Well, what are we going to do? What's yeah? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Um, yeah, what do we do? And it's like, well, the business has been up and down. Um, fortunately, yeah, you know, with what happened with the networks, like we had friends who went broke with what happened with you know the mobile phone networks with them yeah. screwing and screwing the margins down yeah. um where they're stuck in leases and had commitments that they 
you know, committed to and you know, didn't have anything there to back them. So we had property there that backed us. And then we thought, well, you know, business has been up and down. Property's always carried us through. Let's get rid of all the businesses. Um, and I didn't mention that I had pizza shops at the same time too, but mobile <laughs> 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 phone shops, pizza shops. It was like, phone shops. Um, so let's just sell all the businesses and um, you know, live off property without knowing how we're going to do that. Yeah. Um, it was actually you know, that I'd got back you know, back into the shop, had to build it back up because it had you know, run down a bit over the time that I was off with injuries and stuff like that, had to build that back up. And it was actually a customer in the shop that said to me, um, you know, where we where where the business was was you know, a bit of a coastal area, you know, a lot of people go camping and stuff like that, um, yep. holiday area. He yep. said, oh, what are you doing with your you know, property there? Because I'd moved from it. He said, oh, look, I'm you know, renovating at the moment. We might do, you know, might have a go at holiday rentals. So that goes. So we thought that might be the thing. And she said, oh, don't do that. Do what I do. You know, what do you do? It turned out it was rooming houses. Right? And it's like, okay, tell me about that. How does that work? Yeah, the numbers sound all right. Went home yeah, and spoke to Amanda about it and, First, first reaction where a lot of people have it's like, oh, but who's going to be living in the house? It's like, yeah, what are they going to do to the place? Started talking about the numbers, and she's like, I mean, that's like, <laughs> right. And then we're like, okay, where else can we do this? And you know, said about initially, um, yeah, because we had accumulated a reasonable number of properties over the you know, previous twenty years. Said about what are we, um, yeah, you know, what ones have we got? We can can we convert? Yeah, you know, where can we get some? Yeah, other properties. Yeah, bought a few properties while the serviceability was still good from the business before we got out completely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, said about converting those, and it's been. And uh, where I mentioned, even you know, a customer who introduced rooming houses to me didn't necessarily know a lot about them. Had sort of fallen into it as well, and um, and that was where I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I need to learn about it. Where can I go and learn? Tried to find people who could explain it to me. Yeah, and there was people who knew bits of it. Like I could find, you know, someone who knew the building side of it, someone who knew, you know, bits in the health regulations, someone who knew bits and pieces of other things. Um, I did find the Registered Accommodation Association of Victoria, then, but similar thing. Even people within there knew bits of it. No one could bring it all together. So that's where I just said about reading all of the legislation to do with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, yeah, I couldn't find someone to explain stuff, how the stuff in the building code worked, so I read it. Yeah, love it. Love it. What, what, I, what I'm hearing here, mate, uh, is that you, you don't put too many restrictions on yourself and you, and you happen to have a go at things because, yep. again, if I if I look already at what, what you've shared with us, clothing shops, door locking, uh, mobile phone shops, pizza shop, uh, property, uh, draw a line through all of that, then then... There's no limit to uh, your beliefs and what you can do, uh, and yep. again, I think as a fundamental mindset that it, that is a absolutely key characteristic uh, of anyone successful, not only in property but in other areas. But but also what what uh, I'm liking about what you're sharing with us is that the attention to detail. It's not just going right. This is a great idea, and let's just blunder in and 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 do it. Let's do the research, understand yeah. what it's all about. Keep asking questions until we've got the answers, and if they, if someone can't give them to me, I'll go and find them anyway. Uh, that that sort of approach uh, mm. is for, for me, and I get to talk to a lot of people. It's a bit of a standout in terms of those that that really start to make a difference in an area that they put their energy into. Would, would that yeah. be a, a fair comment? Oh, it is. It is a fair comment, um, and I think you know, if you're going to get into something, you do need to understand it well enough to make sure you do it right. Now, uh, yeah. Yeah, people do see things like even investing. You, know, you hear people talking about, oh, but isn't that risky? And it's like, well, you can mitigate a lot of those risks with enough knowledge. Exactly. exactly. So I, I think risk is and just not knowing what you're doing. That's that's what risk is. Yeah. And as soon as the knowledge is there, then it's not a risk anymore because you, you you've yeah. already built in what the what the risks are and what you're going to do about them. So uh, yeah, well, that's that's where I talk about. Um, and you mentioned at the start, and you know, mentioned this before as well, that around, well, you said it was 54%, you know, and it was around the 50% of investors selling five years. And it's like, it's an interesting statistic. And, you know, that comes from probably just, you know, not being informed and people, you know, saying, oh, you should buy this property to go up in value and they get 
sick of the holding costs. The market doesn't move where they thought it was and stuff like that. Like I look at things like, um, yeah, there was big things years ago, like a, in investing in mining areas and it can still work. I don't know people who've made money in mining areas in recent times as well. Yeah, so do I. So do I, yep. Yeah. But yeah. that's knowing the market, knowing enough about it to do it. Spot so on, me personally, man. I wouldn't go near it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it's the old story. I- ignorance uh, and arrogance generally leads to disaster. Uh, yep. So uh, if you do the homework and you know what what you're doing, you've got the right team around you and you've, you've sussed it all out, then mm. then uh, you're in a much better position to, to take advantage of it. Uh, let, let's, let's sort of get into your uh, property journey then if yeah. we can. And I want to go right back for a minute because mm-hmm. one of the challenges I see for a lot of aspiring investors is the start because, it, you know, yep. I've said this a thousand times, it, it's the start that stops most people when it comes to property because they're too scared to, to take the leap. Uh, can you sort of, and I'm going to test your memory a bit now, because if it's 30 yep. years ago, uh, what was your sort of initial uh, interest in property uh, to start with? And then I'll get you to talk about what, if any, initial fears and feelings of concern you had about investing in property at that time. Can you yep. can you remember back that far? Yeah, look, I, I can remember a bit of it because initially, um, yeah, I mean, there was always an interest in property. Like I, like I said, I didn't want to work forever, although that might have changed now because I probably do want to. <laughs> but, um, the, but the, um, so there was an interest there, and I saw that if I go even go back to what I said before, it's like how can I get somebody else to buy something for me? Yeah. That was sort of how I saw it with property as well. Like you can buy, you rent it out, somebody. Yeah, I know. A lot of the time, people who are renting might not like that approach and feel like they're paying off a property for somebody else. But yeah, that's 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 the market. So yep. um, I think one of Robert Kiyosaki's sayings is, "Yeah, you know, life's unfair. Yeah, be on the side of the benefits." <laughs> that's a great. Right. I love that. That's that's, that's awesome. <laughs> so so yeah, I took that approach. It's like, well, how can I benefit from this in the market? And that was where I looked at it. But first, I initially, was yeah, you know, buying somewhere to live. Um, and Amanda was always interested in property too, so I don't know where it came from, but she'd read the you know, real estate section in the newspaper and stuff like that. So we actually bought our first house before we got married. Yeah, right. So, yeah, which was one to live in. Um, it was business to then move to out of that, where I mentioned, you know, uh, um, with clothing, we decided we'd head down the Mornington Peninsula and open up a clothing store. So we went and rented down there yeah. and rented out the house. Yeah, um, uh, our rent vessel before rent, rent vessels yeah. were even a thing. Yeah, <laughs> so we did that, and at that time, the rent payments were above the mortgage payments, so we were positive on the first property. Yeah. Um, it was interesting when we went to buy the next properties. We decided, oh, well, we'll buy a property, you know, down in Rosebud, and we'll, yeah, you know, um, so we can live there. And um, as the wife likes to sort it on this one, what the law likes it or not, um, this is yeah, you know, back in the early nineties still. Yep. Might have been early, maybe late nineties. Late nineties, I'm trying to think when we bought that one. Um, and um, she's like, yeah, you know, um, said what she wants. She wanted a you know, four bedroom house, two bathrooms, all this sort of stuff. And it's like, said, yep, okay, no worries. Budget's a hundred thousand, right? And she's like, you won't get one for under a hundred thousand. I'll prove it to you. Took me to see a few. Third one we walked into. Was that? I mean, I reckon it was underpriced. I think it had been on the market a while, and they'd been dropping the price while the market was moving up. Yeah. And I think we bought it for ninety four thousand or something like that. Negotiated in the driveway. Um, and I've done this. I've actually done this a few times. When she says, "Oh, you can't do that," and it's like, "All right, I'll prove you wrong." <laughs> red rag to a bull by the sounds of things, Mark. What was it, that? It red rag to a bull uh, yeah. in that sense. Of the challenge has been said, and then you talk about Rosebud. It's interesting. My uh, yep. good wife's family. Uh, are down that way and and that hungarian father-in-law that i spoke to you about he he managed to get a property in rye which is right next to rosebud uh, it, i think it cost them uh 13 grand for land and, and yep. not much more for the build back and this is in the 80s so i was a bit a little bit earlier i still mm-hmm. got that place and uh last valuation it was well over a million bucks so uh it's uh yeah, yeah, the yeah, I, I love the uh, opportunities that you've created out of that. Where, where did your property journey go from there? There, so you, you from there, um, we actually only stayed in that property for a, we only been there for a few years, and um, yeah, um, Amanda's parents had bought in a little coastal village called Blind Bite. Yep, 
And you know, they were heading there a bit and you know, kids had cousins in the area and that sort of stuff and she was wanting to buy in blind bite. But at the same time, um, so this is about the year 2000. Um, actually, this is the year 2000. So we were, I'd, I'd started saying, well, okay, business is doing all right now. We need to uh, yeah, start buying some property so we can yeah, set ourselves up for retirement. That was yeah, basically my version of superannuation, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, things have changed since then, but as in, you know, where I was looking at that for the future, now I'm looking at, you know, investing for now, you know, get, get a return straight away. Yeah. But that was the thing. And and I'd be seeing you know, ad, ads for people selling investment properties, as you, I'm sure you do now as well. And it'd be like, oh, you can buy an investment property for only $50 a week. And I'm like, I can't afford $50 a week. It's like, yeah. why would I buy one that loses money? Yeah. So it didn't make any sense to me so i started looking for stuff that made money so i was out in regional vic you know tasmania or somewhere over there as well yep. um so i went on a bit of a buying spree in 2000 and um how many did you yeah, accumulate at that time uh actually in total i bought 10 properties that year so i'm guessing this is back in low doc days if you're if you're self-employed <laughs> uh, it was you, it was fantastic <laughs> have you got a pulse how much money do you want yeah <laughs> pretty much Pretty much. So as long as you had the equity for it and stuff like that. But the the uh, property, and again, yeah, with finding a way that um, with my wife wanting to move to Blind Bite and we'd go down there and it's like, oh, look, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come to Blind Bite, but only if we buy that house, right? So thinking, yeah, that takes the pressure off. A couple of months later, yeah, Amanda comes to me and says, oh, no pressure, but that property you said you'd buy, it's on the market. <laughs> so... I um yeah we went and had a look and it's like yeah okay it's interesting they'd uh, it had been painted internally like purple and green and there was hot pink feature walls and I love those I love those it was, puts everyone yeah. else off but uh, there, there's a, an opportunity right there it's like a pack of fruit tingles inside you know the outside's yellow and blue um it's yeah so anyway so I had a look and I said probably did put other people off and then but the other thing was I said we just bought. Yeah, a heap of properties that year already. Um, and it was like, well, yeah, what a challenge here with buying this that we're probably maxed out in what we can buy. We don't have, yeah, Equity. a hell of a lot of money to put into it either. Yeah. Um, so I'd heard about this thing called vendor finance. Right? So I didn't know how it worked. Yep. So I basically turned up with a, <laughs> interesting when you go back, a $4 bottle of wine, knocked <laughs> on the guy's door. And said to me, oh, yeah, want to buy your house, but, yeah, can you lend me the money? Right? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, sure, I can do that. He just sold it just sold a business for, yeah, I'd, it had a payment for 40% of it, which was probably, you know, four or five times the value of the house anyway, and still more money to come from it. I don't know, yeah, reasonable income on the handover for the business, and he yep. wasn't too fussed about it. So, yeah, sure, we can do that. So, got the lawyers to write up an agreement, you know, paid him interest for five years until we could finance it and pay him out so <laughs> Hello, and, and just to, just to, to break that down for those uh, uh watching or listening in who, who don't, don't quite get their head around vendor finance what we're really saying is that the owner of the property lent you the money to buy the property from him you paid him interest for the five years so he's getting you know and probably a better return than what he'd be getting if the money was sitting in the bank so he, he's making money on the money he's giving you, but that's giving you access to the property that then you can then leverage off to do to do other things. But that's a that's that's gold. I look at how that was done at the time, and it was pretty interesting because he actually transferred the property to me and took a mortgage on it because he didn't he didn't have any money on it. So um, the old. title was in my name straight away, which I thought extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> so you, neither you, really knew what we're doing, but we did it anyway. Oh, I love that. I love it. So, so where did it go from there? Um, look, from there, we probably sat a bit and focused on businesses. I think we did buy a couple more. Um, I did, um, I did have a, a, a business coaching business for a while as well. So, okay, uh, uh, just a just a thing there because I well the, the I, I'm interested here because uh, yeah, in the traditional property uh, steer. Uh, you know, th th there's always this argument about where well, you're, you're buying for capital growth or you're buying for cash mm. flow. And then you hear the cash flow buyers saying, okay, well, I'm just going to go for positive cash flow properties and they'll max yep. themselves out, particularly in, 
wasn't the case when you're doing back in the late nineties and the two thousands because the, the low dock and the old dock mm. uh, opportunities to finance were were much more plentiful and easy to get. But I've seen it in recent times where people are going, no, I'm just going to go cash flow, and they max themselves out pretty quickly. They might yeah. have three or four properties, and it's only giving them, you know, twenty or thirty bucks a week when you take all the costs out. So they're not going to be able to uh, retire off that. Mm. Uh, yes, it's not it's not burning a hole in the pocket, but it's not going to they're not going to allow them to do much either. Uh, yeah. The uh, I'd love your thoughts on what your strategy was at that time. Uh, in the context of getting all those properties, was it was it to try and get enough of them to get enough of that income to then enable you not to have to work? What what, what was the, the uh, strategy thinking? It actually wasn't at that time. It was more about how can I buy properties that is not costing me to buy them, so that you know, yeah, they're there in the future, and then we'll have enough income from them in the future. Yeah. So it was a bit of a you yeah know, future play or a future thought at that time. Got it. Um, Got it. And yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it was in- interest rates were probably, yeah, they had come down after the yeah early ninety. So, but the interest rates were probably still around yeah eight percent or so at the time. Yeah. So, you needed reasonable returns to get a decent return. So, most of what I was looking at, yeah, I was always looking at um, yeah stuff that was ten percent plus. Most of what I bought was probably at around fourteen percent at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which yeah meant that I wasn't putting my hand in my pocket for it. And in fact, I was probably making a little bit out of it. Nothing yep. fantastic. Yep. At, from there, I thought, well, that's comfortable. There's some there. We'll go back and focus on business. Um, and, yeah, and I thought, well, I, we'll do a few more and stuff like that. Actually, going back a bit, one of the things that you were saying about what scared me at the time, like actually buying a property that lost money would have scared me. Yeah. <laughs> that's like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, development and things like that actually scared me at that time as well. And I okay. had friends doing stuff like they might have bought something and yeah, you know, one in the two built two townhouses on it and whatever. And it's like, I'm thinking, how do you pay for that when you're building it? Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I probably shut off a bit to it because it was, I was a bit scared. So I didn't go and learn about how it all works. Yeah. Um, a bit more educated about it now and comfortable with it. But, um, yeah. but you know, back then, and I think, that was probably a bit of a roadblock that slowed things down. Because you talk about how long ago I was doing that. Yeah, thirty years, more than thirty years ago, started buying properties, bought heaps of them twenty-four years ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah, for that, it's 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 a slow game. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people think they're doing stuff quicker. I can yeah do it a lot quicker now with what I know now. But yeah, I think I did okay with what I knew then. So, yeah, no, exactly. And then that, and, then, and then here's the important point: the your knowledge evolves as does your investment strategy. So the the more yep. you know, the more you understand, the, the the more comfortable you are doing different things. And 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 as your portfolio changes and evolves, so so it, it generally aligns with your knowledge and and your comfort level and clarity around w- and what you're doing as part of that. So yep. uh, and, and again with with your approach to life, where you're always testing the edges and and questioning and prodding and poking to understand the nitty gritties of what it all means. I can understand how you arrived at the the uh, rooming house exercise, which which yeah. you know gives you the multiple income streams, uh, and we'll we'll go into that in a bit more detail. But, yep. but so so talk me through. So uh, you had those properties, you got into business. Uh, I think we, you know, uh, yeah, what happened we, then? We did tr- we did um, build a couple of properties. We went for a couple of new build properties where we worked with the builder and built them. Yep. Um, that I think timing on that wasn't great, and again, probably not knowing enough of, about what we were doing with that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, fortunately, but yeah, you know, right at the end, there wasn't much to finish on one of ours. The other one was finished. The builder went broke as well. So, <laughs> when, when was this? Uh, this in the sort of mid to late two thousands, wasn't it? Or? Uh, around GFC sort of time. It was probably close to that. It was probably about two thousand and eight or something like that. Now that I'm yeah. thinking about it, so yeah, yeah, um, okay. it was probably close to that. Makes sense. Been a little bit. Of, might have been a bit early. I, yeah. I, <laughs> I'd yeah. have I'd have to check, but I think no, it was around. Fine, mate. Yeah, um, couple of so with those, and then yeah, you know, the, there was a bit of a downturn in the market and stuff as well. And it's like, well, you know, if we sell them, we're not getting anything out of. We're renting them. We're a little bit negative. It's like, yeah, you know, we can support that for a bit while we wait for growth. Uh, this is one of the things. Um, yeah, Amanda says as well, and I agree with it. I'll echo this as well. If you make a mistake in property, wait a few years. Exactly. It's, so it's very you can forgiving. Afford, yeah, very forgiving. Yeah. So, and that's 
that's where we're at with those. It's just like if we sold them, we'll, we would have probably lost a little bit of money on them. Um, renting them, yeah, they were negative, but we could see that, yeah, where they were likely to go. So with those, we we did. I think we sold one fairly quickly and yeah, got out of it okay. We held the other one for I don't know, four or five years or something like that, um, and ended up getting a pretty good price for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, because they were never like from from our way of investing where we're looking at stuff that's cash flow. Those ones were never going to be, you know. Cash flow properties. Well, yeah. Aside from what we now, aside from what we know now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're looking for quick cash returns on the on the sale of those to inject that into, into something else. You, you mentioned yep. earlier on the you know the the triggers with the you know the unfortunate uh, cancer exercise with a man, and then breaking your leg, and then selling the business at that, at that time yep. uh, as you were sort of uh, leveraging into the the rooming house opportunity, talking to one yep. of your clients that was in the in the phone yeah. shop. Well, one of yeah, well, one of the things I'd, I'd love to to dive into because uh, again, uh, the challenge uh, in property if you don't have an income that you can show to a bank, they don't give you any money. So, yeah. So, how did you bridge that gap uh, from you know you, you had the you had the light bulb moment on the the rooming houses? You, you're selling the businesses. Uh, how were you able to to fund uh, either the conversion of existing ones, which might have been part of the exercise, or, or purchasing new rooming houses. Can you talk us through that? Because that, that's often a cliff, yeah. and a lot of people are scared to jump off. Look, that was there's there's been a few times where we've run into you know blocks and limits on things, and I think that's one of the things that um, is definitely worth talking to, and one of the things that I'll def- I definitely talk to people about how you can yeah you know, get through those points. Um, yeah, the first one of those. Like I said, even there, there was the low dot lending back in 2000. We had run into a limit there because you also need the cash to put in and yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. stuff like that. So we had run into limits there. Um, with um, yeah, when we got out of the businesses into rooming houses. So right at that time, you know, before I lost that serviceability, we went and bought yeah you know, three more properties. I think it was yeah, uh, right. So you had financials from the business that would support the amount of lending. And yep. It, it, yep. as for those who, who don't know, if you're self-employed, they, then at that time in particular, banks would, would still honour the financials for a year and sometimes two uh, yeah. beyond the exercise that would give you the, the borrowing capacity you need to, to do what you did. So that makes sense now. So you'd sort of load it up while you still had the financials to support it uh, is what I'm hearing, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely did that, um, and then got those going um, for borrowing from there. Uh, look, we at by that stage, like we pretty quickly turned stuff around. Like we, when we first were going into that, and when we first got out of the businesses, and we looked at the properties when we first started going into rooming houses, um, where I mentioned we had bought properties that were positive when we bought them through supporting the businesses. We then refinanced, used money to support the businesses, and things that were positive had become negative. Got it. So when yeah. we said, "Are oh, we just going to sell everything and leave, live off property?" Head in the sand a bit. Uh, um, go on and had a look at things, and it's like, yeah, when we did the figures on it, it's like the properties were neg- about negative forty grand a year. Right. And it's like, well, that doesn't. That's not exactly something you can live off. <laughs> so we knew that with yeah going into rooming houses, we had to go fast. Yeah. So. Um, you know, set about converting the properties we had and turned that from, you know, negative 40 to, you know, would have been over 100 a year um, from, uh, what it take us, from October to March. Wow. So from negative 40 to over 100 grand a year in yeah. in cash flow income. That, that's net. Yep. Yep. Amazing. Uh, to talk to us I- like- there's a lot of things that come into that though, because it's having the business background, so understanding what we needed to do and what we needed to look at with the numbers and you know, what was worth spending where and stuff like that. And also from having a reasonable number of properties, because I think we had bought a f- more over the years, so I think we had close to 20 properties by then. Yeah. So you know, having that reasonable backing of having the properties there that we could do that with, yeah. it's not something that someone starting could do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's nearly... Um, yeah, that was nearly twenty years into buying property. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, and that's a very good point, I think. The uh, yeah, can, just to, just to put some shape around that, uh, you talked about the overall position, but yep. are you able to to share an example of one of your properties that that you know free the the conversion to a rooming house was was netting this or was costing you X, 
and then uh, post the conversion, uh, it was giving you why. Can you can you give us a, some rough numbers around that uh, just to put some shape uh, in our heads? Yeah, um, I think of something that we had. Look, one one that I sort of had in mind as an example is one that we actually didn't rent. It was one that was bought for the purpose of converting it. Okay, uh, but had we rented that, yeah. You know, as a house at the time, it probably would have been you know, three hundred dollars a week. You know, we yeah. bought it for two hundred and ten thousand, I think it was at the time, which was yeah. probably a bit cheap because it was a mortgage sale. And okay, well done. Yeah, but even so, that one is probably a reasonably good example because that we went. Um, yeah, one of the rooms in that um, had <laughs> what's this? Uh, I'm going to go a bit more into the story. Um, and it had some interesting renovations done over the time and probably by different owners that had had it and stuff like that. And uh, you could speculate on what it was being used for, but one of the master bedrooms, there's like a master bedroom in the back of the house, they had a big corner spa in there, the you know, red yeah. wall, gold ceiling, mirrors around, you know, lights around the mirror in the corner, big spa in the corner of the room and stuff like that. So... <laughs> Disco room, yep. You can imagine how it looked, but um, the... That one there, that that room itself on its own, that room we rented for two hundred and ninety a week pretty quickly after converting the property. And when you consider we probably wouldn't have got much more than three hundred for the house. Amazing. So yeah. total house I think at that time was about fourteen hundred a week. Fourteen hundred a week. And and what did you need to spend? Like you bought it for two hundred and ten. What did you need to spend yep. roughly to actually make this spend, Um what did we spend on it? We spent about forty thousand on it at the time. I mean that those numbers pale into insignificance compared to what the, oh. the costs are now, but the, the ratios yeah. are probably still still similar in the context of the they, exercise. So they can be. I mean, that was probably. I mean, the ratios compared to your, yeah, your normal rent compared to what you get for the rooming house. Yeah, um, yeah, properties are costing a bit more. The you know percentages on the returns aren't as good as that because yeah, yeah you look at that. That was yeah, that was probably close to thirty percent as a gross return, and it's like yeah. 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 You probably can, if you try hard now, get you know, 15 to 20 as a growth. Okay. But, um, that's that's a lot better than two or three uh, net yields on the, on properties. If you're doing well, if you're structured well, you're going to net yeah. two to three percent. And that, that's, that yeah. means it's going to cost you money uh, ultimately. Well, the expenses are higher. So if you're grossing, say, 15, you're probably netting you know, nine or something like that. Yeah, but that's... Before, before interest, before interest. Yeah. 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 That's, that's still a. Uh, uh, a, a long way ahead of the the, the, mm. the standard routine. So, uh, oh, yeah. look, I really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, all of that. Uh, you, you've obviously now put yourself in a position, uh, pretty much as a rooming house expert, and the, your business is pretty much named that. And you've got <laughs> the, the uh, super yep. uh, super cash flow developments, which are, I, I'm assuming with your son is about yep. actually helping people to purchase, design, and and uh, either convert or create. Uh, Rumi House exercises. Uh, given all of that, uh, what do you struggle with, Mark? Is there anything at all that you struggle with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah the winding down relaxing I talked about before, it's like, yeah, my first thought when we were talking about what are we going to do, well, let's just um, yeah, live off property. We'll sell all the businesses, yeah, have a nice cash flow, and yeah, we can relax a bit. I, I just get bored and do other things. Like even with... Yeah, I mentioned the business business stuff with going into the rooming houses. My first thing was, well, it is actually a lot of work going around and managing them. You won't. And I was doing that myself to begin with. And it, we'll, we'll say we'll say the locations like Rosebud, where I had yeah, where we had our house that we bought to live in. We converted that. Um, yeah, other properties that we bought were in regional Vic in you know Morwell and Trelawan and places like that. Yeah. Um, so I was driving around. <laughs> It, it's, it's like being a hotel manager spread right across oh, the country, basically, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, from the business side of things, it's like, well, okay, how many do we need to be able to pay somebody else to do those bits for us? Yeah. And sort of did the numbers on it and thought, well, you know, we probably need about 60 rooms. Yeah. You know, we employed someone by the time I got to 40 rooms because it wasn't keeping up. <laughs> uh, but then from there, again, the you know, business mindset on things, it's like, well, if I'm paying someone else to do this, Maybe I can leverage that and you know look after other people's properties as well, and turn that into a business. And like yeah, yeah, and oh, 
now I've got another business. And I was like, <laughs> so that's, I think I struggle with not doing things. If yeah. that makes sense. It's like, I just it does. <laughs> can't stop. <laughs> Good problem to have. Good problem yeah. to have, actually. And uh, if, you, if you look look back on your journey so far, then what, what's, what would you class as your, both your worst and your best investment? And, and what have you learned from each of them? The, well, best is probably the one that I mentioned before. I mean, bought it for 210,000. I mean, a lot of things worked out really well with that. We bought it for 210, like I said, spent 40 um, on, you yep. know, renovating and converting it. Yeah. We, um, we then you know, went back to the bank and said, hey, we've renovated this property. You know, we reckon it's worth a bit more. We want some more money out. Bit of back and forth with you know, comparables and stuff like that with them. Uh, um, we you know, got the valuation up another 75000 and pulled out 60000 So, yes. <laughs> So made some money on it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was – that's and that one has been you know, really positive right from the start. Rents have gone up and up, you know, Debt hasn't gone up. It's yeah. like yeah. Um, that one's really good. Uh, one of the worst ones was probably one that we, um, yeah, one of those ones that we built, yeah, which but they were over in Point Cook. So we built that there. Yeah, a bit of a downturn in the market. Builder went broke. You know, if we were going to sell it, we'd be losing money. Yeah. Um, but like I said, time fixes it. Yeah. 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 It, as long as you can afford the time. Yeah. Then that, and that's, that's the key, isn't it? That is the yeah. key. As long as you can plug the plug the hole, if it's a small hole for long enough for, for the yeah. conditions to change, you, you're going to be okay. And that 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 is the key piece is getting you in yeah, that. So point. not over committing, yeah, not over committing and getting stuck. Yeah, and no, I love that. Now that that's a a, a great thing, share. Yeah, one. That was a good one, and this is this was accidentally accidentally good. Okay, <laughs> that was that was a guy down in Roosevelt. So a property we bought there, um, planning to. Um, build a build a house, and we're going to move back down the peninsula. We'd moved off the peninsula you know, to Blind Bot. I mentioned before, and we're going to move back down the peninsula. It was probably, yeah, about a, and we had designs on what sort of. Probably about a year later, we decided, ah, oh, we'll just sell it. Um, we're not going to move down there. We, yeah, we went and had a look at another house to buy and stuff like that. So we decided to sell it. Um, and yeah, it sold within a matter of days for a record price in that estate. Oh. Um, and and then yeah, the first thing is, oh, how, how has it been? Twelve months have we got the capital gains tax? CGT, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> just by chance. Well, I think we were three hundred and sixty-six days before <laughs> selling it. And that, that, that was <laughs> it, it. Would have hurt if it was uh, two days earlier. Then no, and, and I don't think we made about sixty-five thousand or something like that. So still not, not a bad result, mate. Still not, not a bad, bad result. Heading. Yeah, yeah. Not no. bad in twelve months. So at the time, that was uh, how long ago was that? That's probably that's probably I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. So yeah, yeah. probably more than that. Would have been at least fifteen years ago. Yeah, there you go. So. There you go. <laughs> if, if you were starting out again, uh, Mark, what if anything would you invest in differently? Uh look, I think what I'd do differently because I think. Um, chasing cash flow too soon can be a bit of a trap, and that's exactly what I did. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's all good now, but we're talking thirty years in the future. Yep. Um, so chasing cash flow too soon is not a fast game unless you've got the income to support it. Like if you've got a really high income, sure. and you just want to replace that and get out, then you can do that. But yeah, um, that wasn't my situation. So I think starting out again, I'd be, I'd probably sell more properties earlier. Um. Yep. And I'd probably looking at doing something for uplifting values, so you know, renovations, subdivisions, whatever. Yep. So I'd be doing stuff to build up that equity base before yep. I chase cash flow. Yeah, I love that. that, that that's and that that's a really good takeaway for anyone listening in, because uh, at the end of the day, if you're only getting very small incremental uh, positive cash flow, it, it's you're not going to retire on it. You need to grow the nest egg at some some point in time. So there's a delicate. Uh, combination there of of having the ability uh, to generate growth or manufacture equity, like uh, through upgrading properties, subdividing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, while while you then consider the uh, tremendous uh, cash flow multiple income stream opportunities yeah. that, that that you're now enjoying through the 
the Rumi House exercise. So I uh, love you sharing all that, mate. And we're, we're going to deep dive into the the uh, uh, intricacies of uh, Rumi Houses in our in our next get together. But uh, I, I want to sort of give you a blindfold and a cigarette now, Mark, and uh, <laughs> jump into what I call the the bushfire ambush round, where I just hit you with uh, uh, four fast questions. Uh, and the first okay. of those, mate, is uh, what superpower do you wish you had and why? And given that Superman's on the, in the background there, uh, I'm, I'm yep. going to enjoy your answer on this one. Well, it's actually not, um, you know, Superman powers. I'm not too fussed about flying, although it wouldn't be bad and, you know, the super strength and all that sort of stuff. But I'd actually, I, I think um, teleporting would be awesome. Yes. Be able to get places faster, like in an instant. <laughs> Love it. Well, well yeah, given that uh, you, you're clearly spending a bit of time... Uh, uh, across your rooming houses, the teleporting exercise would, would make that <laughs> awesome. But if I now gave you a, a magic wand uh, to go with it and you could change anything, uh, what would you change about uh, a property and investing? Uh, look, I think this comes from the interaction I've had with government in uh, <laughs> in in Rev and the Regional Accommodation Association. I think just yeah, majorly reduce the government interference. They just distort the market so much. Um. Yeah, I, I think the market would work out a lot better with a lot less interference. Yeah, I'm I'm not saying get rid of all of There needs to be some regulation to maintain standards and stuff like that, but some of it just goes overboard. Uh, I think it's become an industry, Mark. Uh, yeah. I, I've had the privilege of being able to travel uh, around the world a fair bit, and uh, every time I go away, uh, I realise how over-regulated, how over-legislated, yeah. how over-compliant we are, we're always uh, seeming to uh, cater for the lowest common denominator and assuming that we're all idiots, uh, yeah. which, which we're not. Uh, and as a consequence of that, there's a whole compliance industry that oh. has been built around this and promoting the fear that goes with it. Uh, and the cost and imposition, frustration and time that it adds to everything that we do uh, I actually think is holding the country back, but I, I'm getting on a bit of a soapbox now. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to expand on it a little bit too. But yeah, to right. All of um, yeah, if the, like a lot of the regulation that has come in, like minimum standards in rental properties and all that sort of stuff. I'm I'm not saying that they shouldn't be there, but the compliance cost on that um, is, and yeah, increases in land tax and all that sort of stuff is leading people to exit the market. Yeah, it also puts up the costs of rentals and the costs of buy. So if instead of instead of doing it that way, if in, you you did stuff to encourage more supply, yeah, right, then people have got more choice about what they're going to rent, and that in return will push the standards up because it'll need to be better to attract a decent renter. So exactly. exactly. So if instead it was focusing on pushing the supply side rather than the compliance side, you'd end up with it anyway. One hundred percent. And um, uh, again, I'd uh, add a lot of hang yeah, well, I, I agree, and, and here's the thing: uh, it seems to me that successive governments have decided that uh, uh, property investors and any property players are the are the convenient donkey to pin the tail on for all of our <laughs> housing woes. But they're they're actually the solution. And if if governments were smart enough to embrace us as their biggest friends and incentivize yep. us uh, to continue to supply, all all this nonsense about uh, housing affordability and the rental crisis would disappear. Uh, I, I, again, I, I won't go off on a tangent on that, but uh, it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine. Uh, changing subjects, um, if I, if you could have a coffee with anyone and they can be alive or dead, uh, who would you choose and why? Well, my answer to this one, and it's probably going to be a little bit different considering what we've been talking about, um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a nerd and stuff as well, and um, it'd be, I, I, I'm going to say Albert Einstein. I reckon his view on things was just different in looking at things. And uh, incidentally, yeah, same date of birth, different year, but... All oh, right, there you go. Same day of birth. Mate. So, I think we'd have a bit to talk about. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. He, he was a legend, mate. Uh, there's no, I, I'd be the same. Uh, I mean, he, he was one of those guys who uh, didn't worry about the little stuff. Uh, you know, I've heard stories that he would uh, get up and he'd have different colour socks on because he couldn't he couldn't give a stuff about that. But, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to the... The reason for the universe, and while we're here, he, he was all over it. Uh, no, love that. Um, uh, on a similar similar note, who's who's the one person that you admire the most, and why? I I probably struggle with that one a bit. Um, 
it's like where do you go with it? I mean, everybody. I, I I don't like to sort of I suppose put someone on a pedestal because I think everyone is human and has their flaws and there's you know good and bad things that they've done that have happened to them to so, yeah whatever yeah. else. So yeah. I sort of yeah you know, struggle with it a bit, and it's like I don't know. I mean, I don't know where I go with it. I suppose I'd say yeah, my mum. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's that's a pretty good yeah. pick. When you, I mean, it's when pretty you good pick because it yeah. Yeah, the, the, wouldn't be who I am. Yeah, spot on, spot on. That ex- extremely well said, mate. Look, uh, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to share the ins and outs of your own personal journey, Mark. Uh, and uh, before we close off, if uh, anyone would like to ask myself uh, or any other property professionals any questions on their property approach uh, and challenges, or you'd like to further discuss anything we chatted about with other like-minded investors in a very safe, relaxed and no-pressure environment, feel free to join us on the Property Hub Collective Facebook group by clicking the link in the show notes or going to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Property Hub Collective. So we look forward to connecting with you and continuing the conversation there. In addition, if you'd like to delve deeper into your specific property needs and challenges in a confidential environment, you can book in with me for a free, uh, well, not for a free, but for a uh, personal solution session by clicking the link in the show notes or by going to knowhowproperty.com.au and hitting the purple book appointment button. And uh, we'll get the opportunity to spend some dedicated time uh, and undivided attention to help you solve your property challenges for a, a full 60 minutes. Uh, we now look forward to continuing our deep dive uh, chat uh, with yourself, Mark, in next week's episode where you're going to unpack the ins and outs of the rooming house opportunity. So remember to always get invested in your knowledge first, and we look forward to talking with you again then. Stay tuned for part two of this interview next episode. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. Make sure you subscribe to Property Hub for free. Get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration along with every episode of Realty Talk. Australia's top online property show for red-hot property investing news and insights direct from industry leaders and influencers. And finally, I'll see you next time.